Thank you, Mr. Cantrell. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming in on this beautiful sunny day. It's sunny day. <laughs> it's a pleasure to welcome to Windrose Professor Hushang Amiramati of Rutgers University. As many of you may remember, Professor Amiramati spoke to us here almost two years ago on a timely subject then of American and Iranian relations. He returns today to discuss some of the problems our countries have and the problems that are still unsolved. Professor Amiramati graduated from Tabriz University in Iran, came to America, and then received his PhD from Cornell. Professor Amiramati has authored 10 books, and the 11th one is about to come into print. He's a frequent contributor to national and international television, including CNN, Fox, ABC, and BBC. He has served as a consultant to the United Nations and the World Bank, and three or four other pages that I couldn't <laughs> add on to interfere with his talk. So his very important topic today is the U.S. and Iran, breaking through the no war, no peace, stalemate. Please join me in welcoming Professor Miramai. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob, for that uh, gracious introduction. You're all very nice. And it's an honor to return uh, to this podium and to this room. This is my third talk here. My wife is a physical therapist and tells me, if you want to know you are doing well, see if they will make you come back. <laughs> <laughs> so I am honored that she says that that's the way I judge myself, she says, and because my patients always return to me. To do your customers return to you? I say, well, at least in Windows. <laughs> so anyway, thank you uh, for this gracious uh, invitation. I'm very honored. Uh, the discussion today is on U.S.-Iran, as uh, Bob said, um, uh, on whether the two countries can at last break through this uh, the status quo that they have uh, maintained for the last 32 years of no war and no peace. Thanks God, that is status quo, obviously, is certainly better than war. Uh, if, uh, if, if they were not to go for peace, I would obviously uh, prefer the status quo. But it seems to me, unfortunately, the status quo has become increasingly unsustainable. So, in a way, Iran and the U.S. have come to the crossroad of making a decision to go for war or make peace. It is, as I said again, repeat, increasingly it seems that it is almost have become impossible to maintain the status quo of no war, no peace. Both countries, in a way, have cornered themselves to this particular position. The United States for 30 some years have tried to talk to Iran with pressure, with isolation, sanctions, uh, and, and so on. And added to that were Israelis and others who have also threatened Iran with war. Uh, but also on the Iran side, has, Iran has also called, called with itself by saying, I'm not going to give in, I'm not going to, uh, to submit, and I'm going to, have to stay put, uh, no matter what you do, I'm going to, to do what I'm going to, to do. But, but the fact is that neither Iran can continue what it is doing, nor the U.S. can continue what it has been doing. In a way, both sides now recognize that perhaps there has to be a, a, a change of mind, of paradigm, of a rethinking of this particular strategy from the U.S. side of just putting pressure and pressure and then Iran side just saying no compromise and no compromise. Both sides know that neither side can indeed afford a war. 
DHS simply cannot afford the war. We cannot afford the war here, and Iranian cannot afford the war there. But then again, I have to also say, unfortunately, wars have never had a rational basis. Mm -hmm. Wars happen just on the basis of the most stupid, I always say, the most stupid things that happen. You know, someone, you know, you know the World War One and World War Two, how they happened. I mean, there was no rational whatsoever. So again, it could happen in the case of Iran and the U.S. They know that for fact. Besides, wars happen for two reasons, or in two ways. They can happen on the basis of a policy. For example, the war we had against Iraq. The President Bush, <laughs> President Bush went to the Oval Office and told the, tell, you know, told the Iran Americans, my fellow Americans, I have decided we to go to war with Iraq. And then the planes, okay, start the bombing. That's one, one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is by accident or incident. And a lot of wars have happened in the past just by incident and accident. So I always, and every day when I get up, when I see still no accident or incident has happened in U.S. Iran relations, I am so happy. <laughs> Honestly. All right. Remember, we went to war with Iraq first, and then with, with Afghanistan and Iraq because of the 9-11. 9-11 was done something that a, a group of terrorists did, okay? And then we just had to go, okay, after. We followed not a policy, but an incident or an accident. It could always happen. Iran and the U.S. are very close to each other. The two armies in the Persian Gulf, believe it or not, they are close, as close as to a stone throwing throwing distance. They are just next to each other. All right. Any wrong move by any side could, you know, trigger some kind of a conflict. Oh, a third party can do it. A third party can blow up an American ship or an American embassy in the region, and the next day we are in war with Iran. Oh, who that third party is, God knows. Could be people in Iran that don't like U.S., or it could be someone in the Arab side that don't like this U.S. Iran relation, so what a war. Anyway, so what I'm trying to say here is this status quo of no war and no peace has become very unsustainable and tenable, not just because the policies have driven ourselves, um, have driven two sides into a, conflict, a, a, a corner, but also other uh, developments around U.S.-Iran relations are becoming increasingly sharper and bit more intense and that incidents and accidents could happen. But realizing uh, these facts, I'm pleased to say that both sides are now talking the reason they're talking a little bit better than they used to. Uh, back in Istanbul, just about uh, less than a, the, the three weeks ago, U.S. and Iran, with, I mean, Iran and fight last one had a meeting. The result of that meeting was quite, quite okay. Both sides came out of the meeting after almost two years very happy. They're going to have a meeting in, in Baghdad on May 23rd, and we all expect some kind of a compromise uh, to develop between the two sides. In the meantime, I have to also say that the, that the, the tone on particularly the other side has changed significantly. The tone, the language has changed significantly over the last month or so. We used to talk just in terms of pressure, in terms of force, in terms of sanctions and isolation and destabilization. Now we are talking increasingly in terms of, well, this nation has pride, these people have culture, you know, these people are rational people, they, uh, they also understand cost and benefit analysis, and 
So it's like it's a completely different language that is coming from Washington, not just from the White House, but also from the State Department, from the Defense Department, but also in the expert communities. People who have for 30 years have opposed ideas like mine, who have been in the relationship trying to, to try to moderate and to bring reason to this process. I've been saying that, you know, Shang is wrong and that the only way to talk to these people is by force and by isolation and containment and that, that now these experts, I would say so-called experts, are now changing their, 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 their tone as well. A lot of them in the last few weeks, two, three weeks actually, a lot of publications that are coming in various places from CNN, uh, you know, side to Time Magazine, to Los Angeles Times, to New York Times, to Washington Post, and so on, are speaking in terms that I have never heard these people speak for, a, for some time. I mean, really never, in fact. They were very, very tough, you know, people. In fact, that language change has indeed spread into Israel now. In Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, now the talk is no more war that well. In fact, people like Olmer, who Olmer, who was, who was the former prime minister of Israel, is now saying Iran has not crossed the red line. The director of the Shemir, the, 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 the Army's uh, intelligence, uh, the, you know, the former the, the director has said very openly that Mr. Netanyahu and Mr. Barak are wrong and they are pushing Israel in the wrong direction, that the, that the animosity toward Iran is in the wrong, that Iran has been made into, uh, you know, an enemy for no reason and, and all that kind of stuff. Again, what whether they believe in what they are saying or not is a different issue. The fact is that we all are trying to moderate, to tune down, to change this language a little bit and become more sort of like hospitable. Again, because Iran has sort of like shown some interest in discussions and in compromise and dialogue, we are trying to also open up the window a little bit for them and say, okay, come in. You are welcome now that you are thinking, uh, you know, in the, in the same way that we thought you should be thinking. That's great. Let's, let's, uh, let's talk differently. So some hope is there. Now, the question really is whether this change of tone and this change of policy, I may say, like, although I'm not sure it is policy yet, but at least the ch change of tone and the language is there, whether this is strategic or tactical. By, by a strategic, I mean, well, a decision has been made that this should be long term, that we would stay with this kind of a language and tone and this kind of a thinking, a view of Iran, as long as we are in the process of negotiation and Iran is still, you know, coming in and, and, and you know, doing what we uh, expect it to do. Otherwise, and, and then obviously, there is this other side that say tactical. It says, well, President Obama needs time to get over with this election stuff. You know, we need time for sanctions to work. Okay, we, we need time to prepare for war. And we need all kinds of, you know, for all kinds of reasons, we need more time. And therefore, we would tune down the rhetoric, you know, change the tone so that they can buy the time. In the meantime, this change will sort of, to some extent, you know, disarm Iran, okay, a little bit. For example, we will take the 20% uranium out, we will reduce them to only 5%, we will take the IIEA back to Iran and, you know, ask them to do intrusive inspections and so on. So therefore, in the meantime, in the short term, in the next 10, 15 months, we do two things. In the one hand, by, by reducing the, this, this tone of talk and be more favorable. First, buy time for the sanctions and all kinds of stuff, and at the same time, take something from Iran. After we are done, then we can go, go back and say, 
you know, uh, there is no deal because you are still enriching uranium. We say 5% is okay, but now we, have, we realize that perhaps that's not okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So okay, you could basically change, you know, your words a little bit. At that I would mean tactical. So honestly, we don't know at this point whether what's really happening is tactical or strategic. Again, my hope is obviously is that it is strategic, that we would stay with the, the kind of thinking that is now emerging in White House and elsewhere, and that we get uh, uh, into in this negotiation process with that thinking as long as you know Iran responds positively. Um, obviously, uh, any change in that uh, strategic position, okay, toward a more tactical uh, move will uh, make Iran run away. There is tremendous, back in Tehran just today, Iran's supreme leader has made a speech. And before I come, I was reading it in Persian. And it's, again, I was very nervous when I was, I was reading, I, was get, I got very concerned. Because the man is saying, basically, we think this is tactical, that the Americans are trying to fool us. They haven't yet shown to us that what the change of tone and this new, uh, you know, opening for dialogue and so on is a strategic, that they would stay with their words. Now, someone has to tell me, he said, that this is a strategic, that they would stay with their words. Who can tell me that? Okay, I hope it's the inside, you know, nobody can tell you. Because nobody dares to tell you. <laughs> if, even if they believe, even if they believe that this was strategic, nobody would say, okay, yeah, this is a strategic. Because the way he put the question, nobody would sort of like put himself or herself in, in, a, in a, at risk on this. And the only, the only uh, person or persons that can do that is outside. And obviously President Obama is the one to do it, uh, I would say. And I'm really hoping that President Obama in the next two days would respond to that and say, uh, Mr. Khamenei, the Supreme Leader, please understand that we are not gay playing, we are not you know playing game here. That we are we are serious, that this is a strategic move, that as long as you are prepared to work with us, we are prepared to work with you. And that's the statement that my hope is that will come soon because Again, the Baghdad meeting in 19, in, in, on May 23rd is really a make or break. God forbid if that particular negotiation fails. Again, as I said, we are at the point of no war, no peace. And indeed, if that was to fail, nobody would be able to stop people like Netanyahu and Barrett, and they would be proved to be right. And not only them, a lot of other people. Okay, and I have to say, uh, I can understand the Israelis' position. The Israelis have been under tremendous pressure from the Iran side. Uh, but then again, uh, I could also argue that the part of that problem really is metaphor, that this is not really real. I mean, I could, in the apprentice, I was just talking to Bob about this Iran-Israeli issue. I said that I have been trying in 23, 24 years trying to understand why U.S., Iran, and Israel are enemies. Again, this is on the practice. Honestly, I haven't come up with a good conclusion for it or answer. The two countries have no historical problem. Absolutely never they have historically any problem, war, or conflict of any sort. In fact, Cyrus the Great has a statue right in the middle of Tel Aviv because the man, obviously, that the Iranian you know, the emperor, Obviously, it was very nice to the Jews when he took over the Babylonian, you know, and the free the Jews and so on, all kinds of stuff. Iran, as we speak today, there are more Jews living in Iran than any country in the Middle East, my friends. As, except, of course, Israel. All right? As we speak, still there are more Jews living in Iran than anywhere in that part of the world. Third, Iran and Israel have never had a territorial dispute whatsoever. In fact, they are completely you know, away from each other. Between the two countries, there are so many other countries. And finally, there is no religious problem. Islam recognizes three religions, 
as the, the God's religions. Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. In Quran, there is more words about Moses than about Muhammad. These are, these are not made up. These are, but I'm a, I'm a scholar, so I cannot make these stories up. But those of you who are interested, you can get any Quran. Uh, they are actually all, and they, 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 they are on internet. All just you have to do is get that Quran and download, and then search for Moses, you know, in the Quran, and search for Muhammad in the Quran, and you will see what I mean. So, what is the problem then? The problem partly came out because of the U.S. Iran and the revolution and this. <laughs> Uh, the new generation of the uh, leaders in Tehran, good for radical, you know, conservative and so on. Because this is not, I wish one day I will come back here and just talk to you about just Iran and Israeli relations. It's one of the most fascinating uh, subject uh, and it's the most misunderstood subject that uh, anybody can really think about. And I think that there's a one subject that has tremendous uh, potential for improvement, both in both theoretically or academically and practically in policy wise. Uh, I never believed that the Iran and Israel would, would, would be enemies forever or whatever. In fact, before the revolution, if there was one nation in that whole world, in that whole region, that was a friend of Israel, that country was Iran. They want to wipe them off the map. They've said it thousands of times. They want to wipe, wipe Israel off the map. That's right. I will come to that point. Okay? Iranians, my friend, Iranians have big mouth, just like me. <laughs> but they don't mean it. They really have big mouth. Iranians have big mouth. And I always tell my American friends, never, never listen to what an Iranian leader says. <laughs> See what they do. The way you judge an Iranian leader is to see what they do, not what they say. Right? Historically, Iranians have had a hard time to speak correctly. It's only unfortunate. It's part of their culture, part of their history, because that history has been a very complex history. A history that has been always in conflict. Iran was the, one of the first empire builders who started fighting with the Greeks, and then the Romans, and then the Arabs, and then the Ottomans, and then the British, and the Mongols, the Turkish, the Turks, and then British, and then now the U.S. Believe it or not, for the, throughout that 25, 600 years of written uh, history, Iran has never lived in peace, in harmony, in, with any big power. Either the big powers took on Iran, or Iran took I mean, this is the part of. I mean, this is not the way you see, for example, Chinese do or or Egyptian or Indians. They were also historical countries, big power, but you can see that they're always behind Iran. Iran always saw itself representing the historic East versus the historic West. Well, that's a again, that's another lecture. It's a big issue there. The point I'm trying to make is that uh, uh, the Iranians. Okay, have, have, have had hard time with anybody who has been a power. Now, Israel is another one. Israel obviously is the power in the region. And that's just like any other power in the region, Iran has a hard time to live in peace with. Okay, uh, I think you have to understand that, uh, that particular culture, that particular history, and that particular mindset to uh, really uh, help you Iran, Iran's relation with either, doesn't matter with the U.S., with British, or with the Israelis. You just have to understand that mindset, and unless you understand that mindset, it is going to be impossible. Now, back to the U.S.-Iran relations. What I was in Baghdad, May 23rd, uh, the, the deal that is on the table for now is the following. That Iran will accept, I'm sorry, first I have to say that the U.S. and Europe will accept Iran's right to enrich uranium on the Iranian, on its own soil, at no more than 5%, which means it can only enrich uranium for 
fuel purposes for energy, whatever, you know, the uh, nuclear energy. Now, beyond any enrichment in the, in the future will be completely stopped, but any enriched uranium beyond 5% will have to go out of the country. So let's say Iran basically, as I am talking, Iran has already <coughs> enriched somewhere in the area of 300 kilograms, almost 550 pounds of uranium to 20%. The 20% uranium is good for fuel into the reactors, research reactors or whatever that is. Now, the deal is that Iran will return all those uranium enriched beyond 5%, which means 20%, to a third country, most likely Russia. In return, Iran will receive as much uranium, 20% uranium, uh, that it needs for that reactor in Tehran University. So that's about the 20%. And then Iran will be uh, given the right to enrich uranium at, on its own soil at, 20, at 5% under the following conditions. One, Iran will accept the additional protocol of the safeguard agreement of the non-proliferation treaty. The additional protocol calls for intrusive on the spot in inspections. That is, as we speak, countries who are not a member or have not accepted addition, the additional protocol, okay, only allow inspections with a prior announcement. The IIEA, the International Energy Atomic Agency, would have to tell the country that I want to inspect your facility. They would say, okay, you can come this particular time. Well, that would allow that country to make all kinds of adjustments, okay? So by the time the IIEA arrives, everything is clean, nicely done, so we'll go ahead and see it, all right? But the additional protocol will make them, you know, to accept unannounced inspections. That is to say, IIEA basically can just jump on a plane Go to Tehran airport, sit them there and say, I am here in two hours, I want to see your facilities. You cannot say no if you are a member of the additional protocol. And beyond that, the additional protocol will make the IIEA to inspect any site that IIEA suspects of any enrichment activity. Now, the problem here is this. Obviously, IIEA, and this is where there, there could be a deal breaker. IIEA has been saying that some of Iran's military facilities are suspected. Iran has said, I will never allow an inspection of my military facilities. Because, quote unquote, many of your inspectors are the spies of the Western countries. And therefore, I cannot allow these spies, they, I can allow them to come to this nuclear site because after all it's open, but I cannot allow them to come to my military site where I'm building missiles and building planes and doing whatever I'm doing. That could be one deal breaker if the West, or the five plus one was to insist that Iran should open up all, all its military <coughs> facilities to IIA. I believe it would be a deal breaker and Iran would not accept. The second place that it could be a deal breaker, and I know this is on the table from the US side, is on the IIA side, is that IIA has been for a long time insisting, asking Iran to uh, have IIA, I mean, have the IIA to interview a few Iranian scientists 
there are a few scientists that IIA has singled out. Hassan Hussein, IA, B, C. And IIA says, I wanted to talk to them. And Iran has been saying, no, you cannot talk to my scientists. You know, why do you want to talk to my scientists? This is my scientists, and it's, after all, it's their right. They say, we don't want to talk to you. These are, so if IIA or the U.S. was to insist that these people were, uh, have to be, you know, made available, I think it would be a deal breaker. I tell you that the reason for this is, as you all know, in the last two years, five Iranian scientists were shot in the streets of Tehran. Physicists. And Iran believes, strongly so, that these people were identified by the IIEA's inspectors. And then, 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 identifications were given to God knows who, who then used it to murder them. Again, I am not, I am not saying, I'm not confirming or disconfirming what Iran is saying. What I'm telling you is what Iran is saying. All right? The one thing we know for fact is that five of these scientists were murdered. Now, Iran says, I cannot make these people available because they're going to be identified and then later on murdered. Now, how could you, how could you convince Iran that that would, be, that would not be the case? Who is going to guarantee the safety of this scientist is an issue. I don't think anybody in the West can guarantee it. So, there are a few places where there could be deal breakers in this coming negotiations. My hope is that the West and the U.S. will deal with these issues at the next stage. That is, in the first stage, it will just say, all right, you don't have to make these people available. You don't need to see your uh, you know, facilities now. Let's go incrementally, step by step. The step, the step one is uh, and then, and then the third, the, another thing that U.S. is asking, which is not a deal breaker, and is a good one, is that U.S. is asking for Iran to uh, stop operating. In fact, it's not being fully operated, but <coughs> it's just to close down for the time being. A site called Fardo. Fardo is a is, is a facility around the city of Gom, about 150 miles from Tehran, and the Fardo. Why we are concerned about Pardo is because Pardo is built underground, 100 meters underground. It is a bunker. It, it's an impossible place to destroy either by bombs or anything. And it, this is a facility that Iran has spent God knows billions of dollars to build. And it's way down in the, in, in, in the ground. It's all completely you know, protected by God knows how many tons of cements and concrete and stuff and all kinds of So the U.S. is saying, you have to close that down because I am very concerned about that facility. I cannot destroy it. <laughs> okay, and at the same time, I know if that facility is operating, it will create problem because we don't know what's going on in 100 meters down there. God knows, I mean, that's a lot. I mean, this is in the middle of a mountain range. Go deep into the mountain, God, God knows how they have done it. So, this I believe is not a deal breaker. I believe Iran will be ready to do that. So, if I was the US, I would basically focus on three things one, Pardo. Second, the 20% uranium to come out. And, and third, the additional protocol that is this intrusive inspections. For the talk, for the first period, that's more than enough. And then, in return, all we are doing is to expecting the, you know, to expect them to go for twenty, for the five percent. Again, a, a month, a year, I don't know. Six months later, we're going to come back on the on the negotiation table, and then we're going to still go for the next step. It seems to me, it seems to me that the West understands the deal breakers. 
there have been a lot of discussions on this, and uh, I myself wrote uh, a few things on this. And uh, the thing that I'm understanding is that now we will not allow the deal breakers to stop this process. And Iran has also been saying that uh, the only concern I have at this point, as I said just a minutes ago, is that I wanted to make sure that you are strategic about this move uh, and not tactical, that uh, you don't want to deceive me in, into accepting all this and then at the end, uh, you know, give me nothing. Remember, we are not giving anything to Iran at this point. Iran has been asking for the sanctions to be relaxed. You know, there is a sanction to come in July 1st from the EU on Iranian oil, and there is a sanction on the central bank that we haven't yet really, uh, as we speak, uh, you know, uh, operationalized in a way. Uh, both of them are very serious sanctions. Iran is very concerned about it. I believe, I believe the U.S. will allow the, I mean, uh, they will allow this two sanctions go as part of the deal. But they will not, I believe, take any previously imposed sanctions off the table. So Iran will still be under tremendous sanctions as all these deals are, uh, are, are made. So in a way, what I'm saying is that in a way, we, we are not really uh, making a lot of sacrifices okay, as we go forward. If, if the deal Iran is saying, I am ready to give you at the three points, it really worth to give. Again, we could, uh, uh, we could hope for the best. But uh, while there is a lot of hope out there, we all hope that something will happen. There are also these deal breakers. Okay, so uh, moving forward, uh, I have my finger crossed. <laughs> I'm pleased to do so on your side too. Now, how much time I have? Do you want me to stop and I get questions? Yeah. yeah. All right, let me. So I have basically laid down what is the problem and where we are now. From, we have moved from the, this pressure and sanction to a more you know, softer line. And we are now very specific about what kind of deal we want from Iran. And they have become also quite interested in this. But then again, as I said, there are some problems. All right, that there are, there are, there are, could, things could develop in the wrong way. Our hope is that they will not, and the reason they may not is because, as I said, both sides really can afford war. Peace is the only alternative. And, and this May 23rd offers that option. If it was to fail, then we are back to square one. And believe it or not, the, if we go to the square one, stopping the war would become absolutely impossible. I could tell you tonight that if the, 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 the deal in, in Baghdad was to break, and if they were not to go forward, we will have, regardless of what happens, we will have a war with Iran. We will have a war with Iran. There is absolutely no way. Absolutely. Listen to this. When you have a policy of pressure, and if the policy of pressure was to fail, what options you have? You have options you have. You can't just, U.S. cannot just simply say, okay, my policy has failed, let me go home. Yeah. Never happens. My policy of pressure has worked, my diplomacy has worked, now the only thing that is left for me is war, and I'm not to go for it. Okay. So that's why I said, if the deal is to break at, at, in the May 23rd, we are for trouble. Thank you. These are some very important and topic, topical questions that Professor Abiramadi has laid on us. Uh, now, we'll take some questions. And uh, Charles? How secure is Khamenei and how far is this vision? Good question. Khamenei is a revolutionary, very anti-West. Khamenei is the first generation leader of a very popular revolution. 
I keep telling the Iranians, the Americans, and other friends that most of us here misunderstand what happened in Iran. We don't take it seriously. The Iranian revolution in 1979 was one of the most popular revolutions in the world. There are four revolutions in the world that are really great. I mean, again, with the exception of the American that we'll keep on the side, which is the, the fifth revolution. The French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, and the Iranian Revolution. The Chinese and Russian Revolution, including also Cuban Revolution, these were revolutions of the minorities. A group of minority activists, socialists, took guns and went and took over the country. That wasn't the case in Iran. It was a popular revolution. Ninety-some percent of the people joined that revolution. Now, that popular revolution has had a, a bunch of leaders. Unfortunately, some of these leaders were very young at the time. Um, they continue around here. And the first generation of leaders of any revolution stays to the end. There has never been a revolution that the first generation of leaders have ever given up on the revolution. As long as Castro and his brother lived, the Cuban revolution will survive. As long as the, Rush, the first generation of leaders of the Russian revolution survived, it stayed. Yeltsin and Gorbachev had no idea of the October revolution back in 1970, uh, 1970. And that's why they destroyed it. In China, we are almost close to a destruction of a revolution. Still, the first generation leaders are around. But in 10 years, that generation is finished, and the revolution will be finished. So in Iran, I think the next generation of the revolutionaries are just about to come. I mean, regardless of how much you dislike Ahmadinejad, he is the, the second generation of leaders who made, in fact, the story that, that, that is. He is sort of like a Gorbachev and the bad person. As far as Iran was like Khatami. The next group, the next group will come and will destroy it. So Khamenei is the first generation leader will never give up. He is a revolutionary, he's anti-West, okay, and particularly American. And that the history of the US Iran relation, of course, goes back to a long history, sometimes very good and other times very bad. But to answer your question, he is a very uh, uncompromising leader. He is very, sus uh, you know, basically sus suspicious. Okay, he's a very suspicious of the West. He doesn't believe them, he doesn't trust them. He's very concerned about the survival of his regime. The regime is very fearful about whether, you know, and he has put all its baskets in the regime's survival. Next question. You uh, talk about peace. What are the prospects for peace with Iran supporting Hezbollah, Hamas, and Syria? Good. Well, Syria, obviously, is a completely different case. It's a country uh, with a leader that is despotic, and it's just like in Libya and elsewhere. The man has come under tremendous pressure, and there is a, a movement there uh, fighting uh, for it. Syria was and is a very close ally of Iran, and it's a very strategic country for Iran. It's part of what we call the strategic, Iran's strategic depth. You know, that's just part of Iran's strategic debt, uh, because Syria gives access to Iran, to uh, to Hamas, to Lebanon, to Hezbollah, and if that line was to, to close, Iran would suffer tremendously. So, uh, uh, as we, but the problem with, with Syria is that we don't have a good alternative to Assad, unfortunately. The people who are fighting Assad are very tough people, very religious, fanatic, People, even the Americans, have had a hard time to come close to them. And the Israelis also are not happy with Assad's enemies. Although they want to Assad go, but they are all keeping a, a quiet, a little bit cautious, as opposed to Libya. In this case, we have been very cautious because in Syria, which has borders with Israel, a change could have tremendous repercussions for the Israeli security. So everybody is in the same page that, yeah, Assad has to go or has to share power, but we just can't simply throw this guy away and take anybody that comes. In Lebanon, in, in Hamas, I believe the Hamas issue is very different. 
Iran is a Shia country. Hamas is Sunni. They don't really live together. They don't. They are, their relationship is very opportunistic. Very opportunistic. And Iran supports Hamas to the extent that Hamas is against Israel. That's all. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Period. Otherwise, there is no connection between Hamas and Iran. If US and Iran were to work together, if Israelis, for example, were to work out a deal with Palestinians or with Iranians, Hamas is finished. Because for Iran, Hamas is not a strategic ally. It's just an opportunistic relation out there that as long as you know you are against my enemy, I help you to, to, to make them suffer. But if I make friends with my enemy, you are finished. Hezbollah is different. Hezbollah is a Shia group. Okay? Iran's relation with Hezbollah is strategic. We could not misunderstand that. Hezbollah is a Shia group, and in Lebanon, Shia is the large the majority. That's very important to understand. But this majority, for the last several decades since Lebanese independence from France, from France, has been on the side. Now this group, just like in Bahrain, is also a majority Shia majority, or in Baghdad, Iraq, Shia majority. Now they are back to the streets and saying, we also count that we are majority. We have to share, at least share in the power. I think it's a, it's a major issue. We don't support them. And I think, again, there, uh, everybody understands that you just can't, simply cannot eliminate the Hezbollah. Hezbollah now is a part of the Lebanese establishment. They have parliament, they are members in the parliament, they have ministers in the cabinet, the prime minister now sort of like is in a way a Hezbollah. So it's a very different situation and they have a very very intelligent uh, a leader, religious leader, Nasrallah. It's very very not only intelligent, very popular in the Arab streets, and not talking about the Arab leaders or Arab uh, governments. Arab streets is extremely popular. It's just the fact is that and Hezbollah, it's incidentally, a few years ago when Israel invaded Lebanon, Hezbollah stood against that invasion and surprised everybody, absolutely everybody. It was the first time ever that Israeli army was failed, failed, okay, in the Middle East. Everybody would tell you, Israelis would tell you, that they pulled out, paid. You know, the problem is this, you know, Israelis, and I have been in Tel Aviv it's a few times, and I, I have spoken to these people. You know, Israelis have learned how to destroy official enemy, official armies. You know, Arab armies, no problem. Five days, six days, three days. But now they are facing the street. They have been struggling with this Antifada, with this Hamas and this Hezbollah for almost 20 years. They, can, they don't know what to do. There is no army to destroy. <laughs> there is no country to destroy, to take over. What do you do? These are street people. So uh, that, that's, that's a major issue. So again, uh, uh, these are very different cases. Question? Can I squeeze one in? Um, because of the importance of the May 23rd meeting, which parties will be rep represented at that meeting yeah. of the United States? First, uh, th this meeting on May 23rd is not a meeting between US and Iran. It is a meeting between a group called Five Plus One and Iran. The five plus one, five are the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. Russia, China, US, France, and England. And one is Germany, which is the most uh, powerful uh, economy in the, in the region, in, the, in Europe. And one obviously is Iran. So the meeting is between five plus one and Iran. The five plus one is represented in that meeting by Catherine Ashton, who is the uh, sort of like the foreign minister of the EU. Obviously with Catherine Ashton are members of various countries uh, from the national security 
In the U.S. side, we have a lady, I forgot the name, the uh, Cheryl, very, this lady who also represented us in the meetings, in the, in the, in the discussions with, with North Korea. She represents us in that meeting. You know, she's a very, uh, she has done a lot of work on the nuclear issue. She's a very popular lady and uh, obviously very capable. Uh, I forgot her name, God say that. Anyway, so, uh, and then on Iran side is Mr. Jalili, who also was in Istanbul just recently. Uh, Mr. Jalili is the, uh, the, the secretary of the Iran's National Security Council, and the, who basically, and this, this is very important, and this is very important. Mr. Jalili always in the last several years have been in these meetings as secretary of the National Security Council representing Iran. But this last time, for the first time, his, the, 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 the order he got, the letter he got, as, you know, assigning him the job, would say, you, are, you represent Iran and the Supreme Leader. You see? Now, so for the first time, Jalili has been also joining and will be joining this meeting, not just as representing Iran, but the person of the Supreme Leader. Why that happened was well, very simple. The West, we here, have been always saying that we don't know who to talk to. Who is in charge in Iran? The President Ahmadinejad, that crazy guy who says Holocaust <coughs> doesn't exist, Israel have to be this and that, or the Supreme Leader who sometimes says things and then it disappears, or Foreign Minister who is nobody actually. So who do we talk to? Or oh, Jalili, who is also God knows you know, what, what power he has. We had serious trouble in understanding you know, the Iran side in terms of representation. I think for the first time, Iran wanted to put that at rest. They said, listen, in this particular negotiations, yes, of course, Mr. Jalili is representing Iran. But if you wanted to know who is in charge, it's me, Khamenei, Supreme Leader. And he is my person. And if you don't believe me, read his, uh, his the, 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 the letter I gave him. You know, the okay. So uh, that's where the situation is an extremely important development that, that Mr. Jalili now represents not just Iran, but the person of the Supreme Leader. Okay. Question? <clears throat> Time is approaching very much. I think it's been a most interesting and informative talk. We thank you so much, Professor. Thank you.